So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six people in the audience now. No, five, five in the audience. Um, Angelica and Marie are still not here. So this would be a very, very small round. We have until, we have like 40 minutes um, to discuss here. So we've only got two panelists instead of four. It's Barbara Yu and Guy Yu. Um, so uh, we probably just start the discussion. Um, maybe I start with myself. Do um, you want to say anything, Barbara? I was just going to suggest we engage the panelists and have sort of... That's what I was just about to say. That's what I was just about to say. We are we engage yeah. the audience. Um, so there's more, more, more people coming on now. I think there's seven in the audience. And um, so, as far as I understand, everybody can ask questions. So I would, um, I, would, I, would I would, like to encourage you in the audience. Um, I think you just have to type your questions um, into this um, chat function that the tool offers. Um, I mean, the last time that I that I moderated a panel for this Horasis group was two years ago in Kiev in Ukraine, which was really great. I mean, at that time it was still like all physical, and and we were able to meet. There was about a thousand of us, and uh, we had very interesting, lively discussions. Of course, now everything is different after COVID nineteen, but nevertheless, the 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 topic that we want to discuss here is, 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 um, is, is hot in these times, I think. And, um, yeah, maybe I introduce you guys, uh, Barbara and Guy, you uh, to the audience. Barbara, you're based in, uh, in the uh, Bahamas, I think, for Windcrest Capital, is that correct? Yeah. So I've done a bit of reading, of course, uh, about Windcrest and yourself. So, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Windcrest is uh, looking at uh, specializes in alternative asset classes, I read. I found it on the web. What does that mean? Can you can you help us with that? I'm not sure I heard as you said what we're looking basically we are a primarily global ex US long short equity manager. And uh, we like to believe that we take a private market approach to the public equity markets and we think that's where you can add the most value. So our, our due diligence tends to be pretty intense. Um, I like to say we get what we inspect, not what we expect. Um, so I phys personally physically go see the companies we invest in. Um, obviously, COVID has uh, made that a little more difficult. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, that's what we do. And, uh, there are very few countries we won't touch. We've been in Saudi Arabia, we've been in Indonesia, India. Um, so uh, we're adventurous. Cool. Thank you, Barbara. And then our second panelist this afternoon is um, Guy Hans. He's founder and chairman, Terra Firma Capital Partners, based in the um, UK. Uh, Terra Firma is headquartered in London, I think, and um, has invested, if I'm not mistaken, 17 billion euro in 34 business with an aggregate enterprise value of over 48 billion euros. Is that correct, Guy? Did I forget anything which I had to mention? <laughs> uh, that's fine. That's more than enough. More than enough, you would say. Okay, more than enough. Okay. Um, maybe I can just shoot the first question to you, Guy. And, and um, so how do you see your business evolving in these days in COVID-19? And with lockdowns all over the world, what has changed uh, compared to 12 years ago? And 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 are we reaching a stage where there where there could be light at the end of the tunnel? Um, right. Okay. Let's take that into it. First of all, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think highly unlikely. Um, I don't. I, you know. I think we're going into sort of a COVID slash pandemic. Uh, era, um, you know, I think you know if one thinks of pestilence, one thinks of plague, one thinks of climate change. You know, we've had really, you know, fifty really good years. I mean, if you were born in nineteen thirty, 
and you could have died at the beginning of this year, you would have really had a pretty spectacular 90 years in the West. Um, I think, unfortunately, if you're born in 2000, uh, this is probably not going to be a particularly uh, wonderful 100 years. Um, so I, I just, you know, I think we've got a really tough time coming. Um, everything out there indicates that. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're talking water, it doesn't matter whether you're talking COVID, it doesn't matter whether you're talking uh, political disruption in the West, etc. So um, I think this is sort of the new normal. Um, you know, whether it's fires, what, what, you know, floods, pestilence, plagues, wars, whatever. Um, what does that mean from an investment point of view? I think it's very, very interesting. Um, on the one hand, um, people move to safety um, because they want to make sure they've got sufficient cash to keep their, their lifestyle going and they want to be defensive. On the other hand, people sort of have almost a, God, it doesn't really matter attitude because, you know, I might not even be around, so I might as well enjoy myself in my investments. And so people are taking more risk. And that to some extent is what you're seeing. You're seeing, you know, really risky investments um, doing incredibly well. You know, the, you know, the it, it, biotech has certainly not gone down in cost through COVID. And uh, a lot of other startup businesses are really, really uh, expensive at the moment. And at the other hand, and, you know, pure government bonds are just at ludicrous levels. You're really not paid to take them. So it's a dumbbell strategy. Uh, take, take risk. Um, and don't take risk. Now, whether it's dumb or clever, uh, only time will, will sell. You know, from our point of view, um, we have really reduced risk. Um, so in a private equity market, that means we reduce leverage. Uh, it means our time horizons have gone out. Um, it means our due diligence uh, is frankly more defensive. Um, so we, you know, we're trying, you know, I will be very happy if I can get eight to 10% compounding for the next 10 years, if I can, if I can finish 10, if in 10 years time, I've managed to beat inflation by 6%, I'll be really, really happy. So that's sort of where I see it. Barbara? Yeah, I'm not as negative as, or conservative as, as Guy is. I, I think um, there are some positive, um, Basically, I'm just a little younger than you, Guy. I've got to be optimistic. I'm going to be around for a while. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I think COVID, while it's exacerbated inequality, it's also um, increased disruption. And there have been some good things. For example, you know, online education is probably a very good thing. A year ago, Harvard never would have done an online MBA course or Stanford. And I've just done a Stanford module online. And so that's disruptive and dilutive to their margins. But it's great for, the, you know, the um, their externalities, let's call them, right? So positive externalities there. So I, I think the, um, I agree with you that there is a scarcity of growth going forward. Um, where I hope to ge generate double digit returns is actually from the emerging markets where I find I can get twice the growth at half the multiple. And one of the things that I really like to do is take my knowledge of a very good business model and find it trading for exactly that half the multiple with double the growth in emerging markets. An example of that would be Helios Towers, um, which is a cell phone tower company in Africa, listed in London. We were there, bought in at the IPO, um, but it literally trades at a third of the valuation of American Towers and half the valuation of Cellnex um, with, you know, with, with much greater growth prospects. Um, and it's not in the indices, right? It's just un undiscovered and unloved. So we feel very safe when we can find um, op opportunities like that. Um, I like to say that things can be popular or safe, but they're rarely both, right? So I think markets and the U.S. markets in general, they're popular, but they're not safe because they're expensive. One of the things that I think has been a real game changer, Guy, and I'd love to hear your view on this um, for valuations, is when we reduced interest rates to basically negative real rates, right? I fear we may have brought forward a ton of stock market price appreciation um, because you discount any stream of cash flow by a negative number or a zero, you get a huge number, right? And so there is this idea out there that cheap money is going to mean happy days forever. 
And I'm not sure that's so true. Japan had negative rates and went nowhere for a decade, right? So um, I'd love to hear your opinion, Guy, on what the debasement of currency means. I mean, for the first time in my fund, I've held gold, gold and silver miners. Um, and you can have a macro view, but on, on a micro level, they make a lot of sense because these country, companies are going to be incredibly free cash flow generative because their largest input cost is oil, which is down, and the commodity price is up. And I have a view that that commodity price will continue to go up. Um, so I agree. So you do have a barbell approach. And I think of my gold miners as a long that acts as a hedge, if you will. Um, and so and that enables me to take more risk with a Helios Towers, uh, for example. But I'll, I'll be quiet there. <laughs> Why don't you chip in, the guy? Yeah, I mean, I mean, first of it, I mean, all I totally agree with you um, about investing in emerging markets. I think the, you know, I, I made a comment a couple of years ago where I said that the difference between Italy and the UK was that people know the Italian economy and political system is messed up and people don't mm. realize the British economy and political system is messed up. So to me, I'd rather invest in Italy where, where I know what I'm getting than invest in the UK and I don't know what I'm getting. Um, <laughs> yeah, the last two years have pretty well proved that. Um, you know, the other way of looking at it is, is if people are right and that 30% of the Italian economy um, isn't ever registered, then, they, then, then they're an awful lot more efficient than Brits um, because they're basically producing roughly the same amount but hiding 30% of it. So, um, you know, it's a strange way of looking at it. Um, and, you know, I think that's, you know, the reality of a lot of emerging market countries. You know, we might think that they're difficult, but if you can buy them at half the price with double the growth, you know, you're getting paid for that enormously. So I, I totally support that. Um, online education, I have to say something that, though, um, you know, we have a business in Finland, which is an educational business. Uh, they have the best education for, system for anything in the world, and they never close down their, their educational system. And the reason they didn't is because they regard socialization as the most important thing that you can get from education. And, you know, the Nordic countries really concentrate that. And so... Online might well work for people going to Harvard who hopefully are reasonably socialized as human beings, though sometimes I would doubt it. Nothing against Harvard, but, you know, Oxford was the same. Um, not the most normal people in, in the world, um, but it is a pretty rarefied group. And we are, you know, we're going to probably not get kids back into normal education for a break of almost two years. And that, you know, is a long enough period to mean that their ability to go back into society and socialize at school, et cetera, is going to be difficult. So I think, you know, you know, if I had to choose an industry, which I'd say in the West, which is going to grow in the next couple of years, I'd choose the mental health industry. Uh, anything you can do for basically getting, getting people back to be able to socialize again. You know, we're all desperate to socialize, but, you know, kids of four or five have never really been through that socialization, and they're going to be starting at seven, which is going to be tough. Um, you know, I think if I look at uh, commodities and what's happened with with, it, with uh, stock market appreciation, you, you're 100 percent right. Um, effectively, whether it's disruption in the IT industry um, or just general disruption through technology, um, whether it's the valuations, we've we've almost jumped a decade. You know, we've it's just extraordinary what has been achieved in acceleration while the majority of people are getting worse off during the COVID period. And that is going to be very difficult um, to, ca you know, to catch up with. It's going to take an awful lot of work to get to where the valuations are. Um, having said that, when you start going into the micro side, um, it's, I think it's more, it's more interesting because there are individual companies which really are, are achieving that or will achieve that. So I would say this is probably a time where we've had a huge macro effect, and now the people who really do well is focusing on the micro effect. And uh, Mark asked a question, um, which was, you know, um, Guy, is 10% of euro or USD dollars enough in a time of unlimited money printing? How to protect a family's assets and safety over the next 20 years? And, and I think that's a, that's a great question because I think a lot of wealthy families are saying, okay, what do I now do? You know, I don't want to risk everything. And my dumbbell explanation is a little bit 
find something really safe um, to put the money in. And, and your commodities is not a bad idea. I mean, have a, a commodity barrel. Uh, make, you know, whatever. the problem with gold is it's too heavy to carry. You know, diamonds are a little bit easier. <laughs> have stuff that you can really, you know, you can run with if you need to. Um, uh, you know, I would also would have some cash. I would probably mix it up with currencies, and I'd mix up where I hold it. Um, get yourself enough money to protect the family if you need to. Uh, buy some real estate in different countries. Obviously, New Zealand was the place. A lot of us have missed that. I'm probably one of the few people who sold a lot of stuff in New Zealand, but never mind, I sold it far too early. Um, and then have fun with the rest. And whether that means giving it to philanthropy, whether that means investing it in a theatre, when, when people can go to theatres, whether that means uh, biotech, um, just go for it. Um, because frankly, who the hell knows where, where to invest? But I think having a, a, enough for safety, and, and it's an awful thing to compare, but a lot of people in the 30s, when I say a lot, I, don't, I mean in the hundreds, not, not in the tens of thousands, were trying to work out how they could save their money. And mm -hmm. you know, some families try very sophisticated ways, and the reality is they weren't successful. Uh, the people who were successful, the people who actually just who got out of the problem, you know, who left left Europe and went somewhere else, and all put their money somewhere else and followed it later. And um, I think you just got to diversify to diversify your risk um, as a wealthy family and protect it that way. Um, I just you know I just think it's completely impossible to predict what happens during this decade. Um, and it, 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 you know, we just don't know. I mean, you know, if, it, it, you know, if you read, read AJ Taylor and you know why wars happen, it's really, really scary because they normally can't happen just because of complete and total incompetence on one side or the other. And you know, we could see. Yeah, I don't want to depress people, but anything could happen in the next ten years. And you know, Mark. You know, protect your family's assets, protect other people's family's assets, but then have some fun with what's left. Yeah. And don't take it too seriously. You know, Guy, I would say the difference between the corona crisis and a 2008, for example, is 2008 was very much a banking crisis. When you, the problem is there's nowhere to hide here. This is global, no. right? Every country is affected, and actually every asset class has been affected. And, you know, one of the things that I'm worried about is universal basic income. I effectively think it's here. The government has been giving everyone money. And when I was at Goldman Sachs, I witnessed something that I think we're going to witness globally. What You have to be very careful about what you give someone. They feel a little gratitude. Oh, thanks. right? But when you try to take it away, it's 10 times the, the impact. right? So at Goldman Sachs in 2001, they took away our fruit basket. Your what? They took away our fruit basket. There used to be a fruit, free fruit, fruit basket. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, I was working on Fleet Street in London, and there would be a fruit basket every few days. They took it away. Cost savings. You would have thought they had cut everyone's bonus in half. I mean, the, the papers kept writing about it, the internal emails. I mean, this was just, you know, people felt really aggrieved. There was a, a psychological contract that had been broken. And when the government starts to take away these these checks that they're sending everyone, I think you're going to see the same backlash. So I don't think they can. And the other so the other thing is how do you explain an all-time high unemployment rate um, with an all-time high stock market? And again, the difference here between now and 2008 is in 2008 they gave they funded the banks. Here they sent everyone a check and they went to Costco and bought a new TV, right? So they spent it, which is why the consumer feels okay. Um, but is it sustainable? And I think we'd all say the answer is no. But will people whine like children if you take away their benefits? Yes. So the government has created a problem here. And if printing were the answer, why did we ever have taxes? And so I think the printing presses have been turned on, and I don't know how you turn them off, which is why I think you know commodities and things that are scarce and re of scarce resource value are a particularly good hedge now. Guy, do you think there's a sustainable way out of that, what Barbara just described, like turning on the printing press uh, for an indefinite time? What, what could be the scenario to get out of this? 
I think look, it depends on what country you're in. Um, but one thing we know is that the type of democracy we have today, which is a very individualistic democracy, which runs, it's sort of a strange thing. It's individualistic because we're all for ourselves, but it's more rural because we can use the internet in ways of sort of whipping up opinion, you know. Um, it's very difficult to get it out in that system. You know, the only way you can turn that system around is pretty authoritarian. And, you know, that's what obviously would happen in Europe. And, you know, we like to think it was just a strange fleet, but I don't think it is. I think human beings, you know, if they feel feel scared, they will pretty well do anything. And so an, author an authoritarian state can turn it around because you can force it on people. A non-authoritarian state, it's very, very difficult because the only way you can do it is by a, a very, very strong sense of, of shared community. And that shared community um, really doesn't exist in a lot of countries today in the West where it did exist 60, 70 years ago. We, you know, we are in a very different world. Um, in, in, you know, we don't, very few Western countries, if any, have a majority of people who are practicing Christians. Um, you know, in the UK, there's more practicing Muslims than there are practicing Christians. Um, you know, so the church isn't binding people together. Political parties are, A, at their lowest support levels, you know, since the war. But they're more, people are more variable in terms of what they get to support. You know, and the UK, you know, in reality, the Conservative Party, which at one stage had nearly 10 million members, now is down to like 160,000. And 60,000 of them joined to vote for Boris to make sure we exited Europe. Uh, you know, so, you know, that is not represented democracy. That's a minority taking over a party yeah. to achieve yeah. something. Exactly the same thing in the Labour Party with Corbyn. And, and getting back to that in the UK is going to be just about impossible. The US effectively has the same thing with the, you know, the left and the right, you know, with Trump and with Biden, um, you know. Maybe you, you could have had Saunders, which would have basically really demonstrated it. it, it it's very, very difficult in a democracy. Um, and it, it's, you know, I hate to say it, it's going to take, I think, enormous amounts of pain before we get to a point where humans say, actually, this is just too awful. You know, there's a Golda Meir statement which she says, well, have peace in the Middle East when all adults love their children more than they hate their neighbor. And that's a very, very true statement. And, you know, until we're willing to work with our neighbor to solve the problem rather than trying to be better than our neighbor, I, I don't see that we're going to solve that. And it doesn't mean as investors we can't make a huge amount of money. Um, and it doesn't mean that the rich won't be able to get very wealthy, but, you, but they've got to be careful of the guillotine, um, which really, you know, it's out there. Um, and, you know, it, it could come back to life again. So I think it's a very, very difficult next 10 years and I just you know I really really say people need to work out how do they protect themselves and they also need to think about what do they socially say from politics you know Goldman Sachs bankers complain about losing the fruit basket you know is sort of that's guillotine stuff so you know in Europe I think most people are accepting taxes are going to go up I don't think there's the same acceptance in the States. And mm. you know, the reality is we, to, we're going to have people expect, I mean, Barbara could not have been more right. Um, you know, in surveys in the UK, you know, there's about 30% of people just don't want to go back to work now. They just want to get what they've got paid in further. And some businesses are finding even more, 70, 80% of people refusing to go back to work. Um, and when I say go back to work, I mean even doing Zoom or anything. They just don't want to. You know, they've been paid for six months to do nothing, and they, they enjoyed it. Mm. And they think, you know, it's, it's, you know, why should the government change it? You know, is so it, it, if you compare this with the Blitz or you compare this with the Second World World, the, the spirit of community was so much stronger. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've lost that spirit of community, and it's going to be really tough to get it back. Yeah. It's, and by the way, Barbara, it's not your generation's fault, it's mine. It's, it's, all, <laughs> us, it's all us factorized. We, we wanted something and we didn't, we didn't expect the unexpected consequences. 
I want to encourage the audience. Um, if you want to ask questions, I understand you can just type the questions in the um, in the um, chat chat function. There, I can see there's a there's a um, small window which says comment or ask questions. So feel feel free. I mean, we've got Barbara here uh, from Wincrest and Guy from Terraforma. Yeah, so if you have any questions, just just, just go ahead. But Guy, it's very interesting what you said. I really I kind of like it how you how you explain it. And because I look at Asia, I'm head of the Asia desk here in Zurich at our paper, and I do a lot with China. And um, so this sounds like and correct me if I understood you wrong, but this is also a crisis of the political systems in the West, or? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a crisis of political systems, and, you, you know, you're losing, um, we're, we're, we're losing, we're, we're losing the support of the, the public. And, you know, if I think about, I mean, Fernando has asked what went wrong. I, I think what went wrong is that the whole idea of factualism was really to give people back the ability to succeed. And there's no question she did that. And to let the free market run things better. And that worked incredibly well in in producing wealth. And that wealth was produced in the UK and by 2000, you know, the UK had turned itself around from being the sick man of Europe to be the, you know, the, the wealthy growing man of Europe. Then the question is, what do you then do with that money? And, you know, Norway's made a big, they've put their money away. I mean, they've, you know, they've built a huge, big fund. The UK spent it. And, you know, we spent it, if we're honest. We spent it on foreign holidays, uh, cheap Chinese goods, um, on subsidizing immigration, um, which, you know, you can say what immigration, how much immigration you want and what type of immigration you want. The, the reality is if you ask the majority of people, 80% of people come up with the right answer, with, with, with what I think is the right answer, which is we need immigration to some extent, but we don't need completely unregulated immigration. And the UK just effectively just said, hey, you know, we just want to get bodies in. And it's been a, it's been a disaster because it's, it's, it's created a complete social breakdown in parts of the country. Um, and we went wrong because we basically didn't, We just felt we could do anything we wanted. It it was just hubris. We could have lots and lots of money. We could have a great health service. We could take anybody in. We could do this. We could do it, and we could do it all really quickly. And you know, as our chancellor at the time, in you know, 2007, said, "We've broken the cycle of economics." And of course, we hadn't. And one of the reasons people could spend so much was we just let people's borrowings go up more and more. Mm-hmm. And so what did, the, what, what did my generation lose? We lost it because we basically felt we could do everything. And we forgot that actually, you know, um, as you know, my first lesson at Goldman, my, I, I worked at Goldman as well, and I was told, told three things. You know, what goes up will come down. What goes down might not go back up. Um, shit happens, and you can always rely on the politicians to fuck it up. And I hate to say it, but those three things are a pretty good matter for anyone investing. Um, So what did we do wrong? We tried to go too fast and we didn't spend wisely the money that the generation earned. We spent it on the wrong things. We didn't spend it on building the infrastructure. We didn't spend it on reducing the the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor and getting education. We didn't spend it on getting rid of generations of people in the UK who've never worked. You know, 25% of the children in the UK are born now to families where no one has worked for two generations or longer. Mm. And that's just creating an underclass. And that, you know, that's just, and, and these problems we just never saw. We just, we just rambled nicely in our nice new, new cars and, you know, and our foreign holidays. And, uh, you know, we got it wrong. And, you know, unfortunately, we, w- we probably won't pay the price. The people who pay the price are those who are in their 20s now. This is great. No, I agree, Guy. I, mean, I don't want to interrupt the discussion. Go ahead, Barbara. Go ahead. No, I, I, I agree. And um, 
the necessity for capitalism, but also the limitations of it, right? And to Severe's point here, where he's asking when the rich get richer and the middle class get poorer, who will pay the price? And what we're talking about there is populism. And you're seeing a rise of populism globally, right? It's not only in France. You had it in the U.S. Um, sure, people were upset over racial differences, but also the devil finds uh, finds things for idle hands, right? It, these these a lot of these people riding are young and, and don't have big stock market portfolios. They're sitting at home. They don't have a job. They're upset. There's angst, and 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 they're demonstrating, and. Um, so, and I think you're going to continue to see that, and um, and and that, and it's not good, but it, it's the status quo is unacceptable, and so I think to Guy's point, we the, those days are over. Yeah, and and Fernando, you you put a good question, which is it actually as many as 25 percent of UK born families who've not worked for two generations? Mm-hmm. I'm actually taking two two um, Zen as I um, whatever you call them. Um, circles, circles, and assuming they overlap perfectly, which of course they don't, which is that 25% of the children in the UK are born um, to families um, who are living in poverty. So they, they're basically living in poverty. And poverty in the UK is below 13,000 family income. So it's very, it, it is low. Um, and then the other thing is that of people who live in communities um, which are which are this 25%, 25% um, have, have not worked for at least two generations. So th- it isn't a perfect overfit in reality. So it, it's probably less than 25%. It's probably about 10%. Um, but, you, but you have 25% of children born now into families who really have no, 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 no level of income, which is... Yeah. Uh, Guy, yeah. I, want to come back. I want to come back for a second to your very sobering assessment about the past 30 years. I mean, it started in the early 90s when globalization really took off and then later China entered WTO. And I mean, you you remember that. um, um, We loved Alan Greenspan and and it was driving up markets and, and we were all cheering. Nobody warned. No warning signals. At least I can't remember any. And, and, and so we just kept on running, 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 and we thought this is a great story and will never end. It will never end. And, and now we're in 2020. No, it's 100% right. I mean, there's a reason why cycles in the human sort of meant to last 70 years. It's because when, when, when the last person who can remember the last problem is dead, it happens again. And, you know, we're pretty close to that with regard to the Second World War. Um, and unfortunately, we're pretty close to that with regard to the depression. And, you know, we, we, we decided we could basically beat the basic rules of economics and capitalism and socialization. And when I say socialization, I mean how people relate to each other. Um, and, you know, the reality is we, we, you know, we can't. And, you know, hopefully the next generation... The problem is the next generation is going to have to sort it all out. And by the time it gets to their grandchildren, they're going to be suffering. Uh, Because I don't think it's going to change. I think this this cycle is a very human cycle. Um, You know, we have the capacity to learn, but we seem to not have the capacity to remember. Um, You know, capitalism is an absolutely wonderful um, system for getting economies to succeed and making money. It's a terrible system for working out how you you use it. And, you know, the fact that you're very good at making money doesn't mean you're going to be a very good person at doing other things. You know, there's no no connection that I've ever seen between um, morality and ability to make money. Um, You know, and, and to me, we sort of, we, I don't know, we, we sort of, you know, in the UK, I, you know, I can't talk for the US, but in the UK, anyone who's really successful at making money sort of ended up in some form of government government tank. I mean, you know, we, we, and, you know, it's, it's hysterical. If you look back at the people that both Blair and Cameron, you know, gave quangos to um, because they were successful, and you look at how their businesses have now done and the sort of scandals they've had, it's mind-blowing. Um, but, you know, we just made the mistake of just thinking, hey, you're good at making money. You must be good at solving our country's problems. And it's just not, not it's just not true. You know, 
<laughs> but I think it's so bad in, in so many ways that there's a renewed focus on sustainability, particularly from the younger generations. And, you know, if you just look at the environment, for example, I think there will be a renewed push um, because the environmentalists never had a, a perfect case study, if you will, right? But you, know, you look at Venice and what happened, right? They're, they're not going to let this go. We, we know that um, we are living at living today at the expense of tomorrow. Um, and, you know, just look at, I mean, I used to, I think I spent 11 days in the Bahamas last year. I was, lived on a plane. I haven't been on one since March, right? This sort of c- communication is going to take place of a lot of that unnecessary travel and um, which is negative for the tourism industry, clearly, or the hotel industry, but positive for the planet. And so I think there's a renewed focus on sustainability on, I think Biden probably wins the U.S. election. Um, and I think the U.S. becomes a little more like Europe. I think taxes are going up and, um, and, and you know, there is going to be some redistribution of your generation's <laughs> wealth guy, right? It's, it's time to pay the piper, I think. It's gone too far. I can see that uh, that Marie from Northern Trust has come on, and she's in the room with us now. And uh, hi, Marie. We're we're right in the middle of the discussion already, and we've had an interesting exchange of arguments where Guy was giving us a very sobering assessment of the current situation and what went wrong um, over the past 20 years. And we're looking at like um, in the face on the background of the um, Corona crisis, um, also looking for. For some light at the end of the tunnel, or um, opportunities, or reason to be at least a bit optimistic, Barbara has given us um, a few examples, like um, online education, the whole issue of sustainability. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Marie? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think it is an interesting time because if we learned anything that technology has been accelerated and the ESG agenda has been accelerated. And one of the ways that we talk about this is if you look at all the different components, um, the environment, we are very clear and cognizant of all the trade-offs that we make, that we do see revitalization of the globe when we do shut down um, you know, tr- transport and the like. The social agenda has been pretty forefront in the racism crisis, but from a COVID aspect, caring for people during times of duress, and that could mean your clients, and that could mean your employees. And having at the leadership table a diverse group of people to source uh, solutions for this has been very powerful. And then the last thing I would say is the G piece of it, certainly from a governance standpoint, operational resiliency has been paramount for regulators and for running business and delivering on KPIs. So all of those things in combination, I I think the world is really waking up and saying this has legs. From an investment standpoint, there is an expectation of not only just the environment, which coincides with EU recovery program, right? Because that's very focused on reducing carbon footprint between now and 2050. But the whole totality of why ESG makes sense, that's going to influence product manufacturing and the way people invest. Do you see that, Barbara, what Marie just described? So for me, the ESG thing is not such a big revolution because if something's not sustainable, it's unsustainable, and I don't invest in unsustainable companies, right? So, um, so a lot of so although there's some hype around and it's called ESG, it's something that I've always done because they're the tenants of a good company, right? That's why I take the time to go see them and personally meet the management teams and ensure they have skin in the game. And right. But um, but I think it's great that there is this focus on it. And I think it's also wonderful that people are becoming more focused on how do they measure it. Um, I can measure it because I go see every company and I make up my own mind. Right. But um, it's not as easy for 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 others. And so I think measurement is the next step in in that um, in in that um, trend. And I'm encouraged. It, 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 I mean, how can you say running a company unsustainably is a good thing, right? It, it's like oxymoronic. Of course, the company should be run sustainably. Mm. 
And what, what I'm yeah. adding that is, is uh, agreed, right? That's almost a forward-looking indicator of an overall health of a company. But since I, I moved here um, to Europe from the U.S., when I left in 2018, one in every five managed dollars went into an ESG strategy. And then the next year, they saw a 33% increase of ESG investing on top of a low base, right? Mm -hmm. Here in Europe, it's night and day from the perspective of the willingness to invest. And we've, and we've been doing this for 30 years. So when people say, wow, you know, ESG is important, we're welcome to the club. Very similar to your reaction. But I, I do think, to your point on getting to the right metrics and evaluating it, it, it fosters a better dialogue and people rallying around the cause. And that's, I think, the important change that has taken hold because investors are now saying, this really does make sense. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you expect, I want to ask a question, um, maybe two or three of you, do you expect a substantial change of the investment environment globally after November 3rd, after the elections in the US? And if yes, what could it look like? Whoever wants to answer. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Guy, go ahead. Um, I mean, yes, I think there will be a change. Um, and You know, you've got basically, you know, three possible results. Uh, Trump wins, uh, Biden wins, or it's a score draw and God knows what happens then. And by a score draw, I mean it's so close that, you know, you can argue it both ways. Um, and people say that can't happen. Well, it happened in, you know, I think it was 2000. And, you know, we had the hanging shards of ballots, etc., whether they're counted or they weren't counted and all that stuff. Um, except for I think this time that would be taken very differently than it was, you know, 20 years ago. So, uh, you know, um, I'm not, not in America. I'm not an American, um, but I love America, and I just hope it's not a score draw. I think that's the worst possible yeah. outcome. Mm -hmm. um, I hope one side or the other wins reasonably, demonstrably. I don't think that's going to happen, but I really would like that to happen. Um, I, I would hope... It wasn't going to be based on voting very much on race and age, but unfortunately, I think it will be. Um, and that, to me, is a very dangerous combination. Um, you know, in the UK, it's like something like, I mean, it's quite extraordinary. People who are over 64 in the UK, you know, virtually totally vote conservative and right wing. And people who are younger virtually totally vote um, against the conservatives. And, you know, I don't think, I don't know whether this is extreme in the States, but it's very extreme in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, you know, it's inevitably going to be a very divisive election, which mm -hmm. is a pretty obvious thing to say. If Biden gets in, I think people short term will be very nervous about what it means. And he's going to have to use some wise counsel on the side. I don't think he's going to be that liberal economically. Um, so I'm actually not that worried. He will increase taxes, but you know, you know, in Europe we're thinking of taxes going up, you know, 25%, you know, 12 points, um, which I think is probably what's going to happen at the rich end. Um, you know, the US taxes going up 25% would still make them pretty, pretty cheap compared with, with most European countries. So to me, that's not very scary, but I'm sure it's scary if you're sitting in the States. Um, Trump getting in, I think, frankly, Europe, I think would just pretty well just give up. I mean, Europe is already very, very uncomfortable with the US. And I think the rest of the world will give up. And I think, you know, four, four more years of Trump in terms of America's international standing, forgetting about what happens domestic, international standing, I think will be very disastrous for the free, for the, for the, for the free West. I really do. Um, so, you, you, you know, I think it's short term pain with Biden from the markets. Um, but I think it's long, long term for Trump. Having said it, one of my sons says, you don't want either of them. And four years of Trump is better than eight years of Biden. I would be surprised if Biden, all the things say, that his comorbidity score won't get him the lasting eight years. Unless he's very lucky. Yeah. So anyway, so anyway, that's, I apologize. I'm not an American. I shouldn't really be talking about it, but I thought I'd bump in anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you for that guy. Great. Do you want to add anything to that, Barbara, uh, Marie? 
Yeah, I mean, I'd say uncertainty um, is high, and you just have to look at the record number of expatriations from the U.S. to confirm that, right? So they're, they're, people are nervous. What are they nervous about? You look at last year, the U.S. stock market was the best performing, and it was all due to multiple expansion. It was not earnings growth, right? And so, and how did they? And so, the other thing is, um, so much of the EPS growth that we've had has come from share buybacks. And if the Democrats come in, they're not going to look so favorably upon buybacks, right? So you have the possibility of higher corporate tax rates, um, reduced buybacks, the breakup of big tech. Are you frozen now, Barbara? Uh, is he? I think we lost you, Barbara. I think we did, yeah. Yeah, hold on for a second. Uh, we had it before and she came back on. She came back on again. Yeah. System is a bit unstable. Um, that gives, yeah, we just see if she comes back on within the next one or two minutes. This gives me the um, opportunity just for some, some organizational issues. Um, our session is supposed to end at uh, 5 p.m. CET. Barbara is back on, I see. Yeah, yeah, we just lost you, Barbara. Um, I mean, we still got like, Like, like yeah. 10, 12 people in the audience. Yeah. Hi, Barbara, welcome back. Um, um, so I would just suggest um, we continue for another 10 minutes, especially because Marie, you came, uh, came on a bit late. So um, we were just talking about, Barbara, do you want to continue? We were talking about the um, possible election results and you were talking about the American stock markets, which performed very well, but um, also in the light of uh, share, share buybacks. And so on. So, in case this this, this cut off interrupted, you just continue. Oh yeah. So I mean, so you know the the last 10 years have been phenomenal for the U.S. stock market, and European markets and emerging markets have really lagged. So, might this be the catalyst for people starting to look elsewhere if the, the U.S. is not as safe as they had perceived it to be before, right? Um, and uh, What to counter that, I would say when you look at the MSCI all country world, 56% of it is in the US. And as long as indexing is there, does that just mean 56% is always going to be in the US and you know, the marginal dollar is not going to move emerging markets? Right? So you need a, a, a shift. So you'd actually also need increased active management. Um, you know, one of the things I will say is. I'm, I'm not a fan of, I, I think passive has a place, but I, I believe that there is also a place in portfolio for concentrated um, portfolios who can really create alpha. Um, and um, sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah, and I think, and so, so yeah, go to Marie. I'm, I'm, I'm lost my train of thought. Marie, you you want to add, add anything to that? Investment climate? Post-U.S. election? Hi. Um, we just have it at a 50% likelihood right now. So to the point that we were talking about uncertainty, um, you know, markets make money off of volatility. But, you know, from the longer term, you know, we're just trying to watch and monitor. So nothing more to add on that per se. Um, you know, we've already have priced in into our capital market assumptions, the likelihood that, you know, of different outcomes and what the impact would be. I think a fair question is, is what happens with rates, you know, overall, particularly since, you know, that does impact, uh, um, you know, particularly banking industry and the like. Um, we have a call that uh, we don't expect the Fed's going to go into a negative rate environment at this juncture. Um, so, you know, more to come. Okay. Now that I'm talking to you, Marie, just um, let me just continue with another question, uh, which 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 uh, moves us back to almost back to the beginning of the discussion. Um, um, we were talking about this before when we prepared for this uh, panel. Opportunities that you've seen coming up because of of during the COVID-19 crisis, new opportunities. So new business opportunities, certainly, um, from the aspect of we're uh, known very well for being uh, so firms who are looking to 
you can quantify and get paid on risk. Um, we're seeing flows, and, and that's been a very good positive. Um, and there was an interesting shift in investor sentiment from the institutional space. I saw a statistic that 82% of investors um, who originally would not uh, go and change and go with a new investment manager would now feel more comfortable to do so through technology. So leveraging technology, I think, in new ways and, and being at pitches and, and being involved with uh, uh, more business opportunities is good. The reality is, is things have been elongated, particularly in the institutional space. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think it, it presents the opportunity for us to get better and more savvy with how we're going to connect and, um, and, and, you know, be better able to serve our clients, if you will. Mm. Okay. I'm not sure about that. And I, I think um, in asset management, if you have scale, you're, um, you're in the tent, if you will. It's a virtuous cycle. And if you don't and you're outside, it's a vicious cycle. So I think the ability to do diligence a smaller manager has become exponentially harder during COVID. And that what you're having is the big getting bigger. In my industry, 90% of the assets are with 10% of the managers, and you're seeing an acceleration of that trend. So they might switch from BlackRock to Vanguard, but they're not going down the risk spectrum in their mind to an emerging manager who's doing quirky niche things, right? Um, so when things get so bad, they actually become an opportunity, and I think the opportunity here is to consolidate operations in a centralized place that are world-class, um, and akin to a black box where no one's going to question it so that you only need to do diligence, the manager's brain, which you can do by reading five years of their letter. And that will incubate greater diversity in the industry and unlock the alpha of these niche, amazing managers who aren't just index hugging. Right. So I'm I'm not I'm, I'm hopeful, but um, I, 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 I think we need to do some work here. Hey, guys, there's a very interesting question coming here from Alessandro. Um, I want to give it to Ron here. This is how attractive will real estate investments be in future? I wouldn't want a shopping mall. <laughs> <laughs> guy, guy has some hotels. Why don't you tell us, Guy? <laughs> guy, what do you tell us? Yeah, I think it's very micro. I mean, you know, I managed to do two investments in uh, going back a long way back in 1990. Uh, one was in Docklands, which everyone thought was completely crazy. And one was a nice uh, industrial park in the north. Um, they both cost about the same, about a quarter of a million. The industrial park in the north, I think I, so I sold for about uh, 40,000 uh, 20 years later. Um, and, you know, I'd lost 80% of my money and I didn't get much, didn't get much rent doing it. Uh, I, think I, I think I had three tenants and then and basically I didn't get anyone else. Just, it was kept going on. Um, it wasn't a Rotherham, to be fair, but nothing against Rotherham. Um, so, you know, sort of Sheffield area. Um, Docklands, you know, you know, it went from 250 to about, you know, two and, two and a half million, you know, 10 times my money. So it's just going to be very, very, very particular. Um, I, I, I think there's going to be some incredibly attractive real estate investments out there. Um, and there maybe are some at the moment We're you know, we're looking at one at the moment and it's just, it's just really, I'm going to, at some point I'm going to have to suck hard and either buy it or stop dicking it out. Um, but it's a, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's a tough decision in this market. I mean, this is buying, it is actually, it's buying a whole load of sort of mixed, I mean, it's mixed, low quality industrial and retail, but it's okay, very, so, so guy, British land, 50% of NAV, West end office, are you a buyer or seller? <laughs> <laughs> I if I control it. I'd be a buyer, but I'd have to be able to control it. And I'd want to do the due diligence on actually where it really is that at NAV. But yes, probably a buyer. <laughs> you know, there's an interesting school of thought. There's there's two uh, observations. One is that people are being more remote, so real estate, commercial real estate, is a lot more at risk. I did hear though um, a couple. Of that were thinking that even though they're going to have people in, they're going to need more space between them. So less people in and therefore more space. So will they really need, you know, a, a lesser amount of space? Um, maybe not as profoundly as we originally thought. No, I mean, that's actually is a very... listening to Bruce Flat. 
<laughs> hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, the system, the system is telling me time is up. One minute thirty four seconds left. So we can just continue, but don't be surprised if we if we're cut off all of a sudden. I think the system will automatically cut us off. But guy, you were just talking. Just continue. I love it. Yeah, I mean, we've just actually done that. We spent a lot of money, and we split. We went from one hundred and forty down to fifty, and that's all we can have in the office anymore. And actually, I got to tell you, it's a much nicer environment. So we will have let people work from home when they want to, come in when they want to, and yes, it's, it means our cost has gone from six thousand pounds per person to sixteen thousand pounds per person. But maybe it's worth it. So we've actually, yeah, you know, almost a third as many people. It's very, guy, very difficult. You've got, guy, you've got fifty seconds. There's a question from server: buy or sell? Portugal, Italy, Spain. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I've been buying Italy for a very long time, and being completely lost. <laughs> um, one of these days it's going to prove me right, but it could be a long time. Um, you know, Portugal. I, you know, I feel positive on all three countries, but you know, making money there was a, a little bit tougher than actually being positive on them. So, would I buy if I could, if I could buy with a local partner and I could really understand what I'm doing? Yes. But I think I probably need to be there. I think there's plenty of money made to make yeah. in three places. Okay, so I want to thank you very much, all of you, Marie, Barbara, Guy. I think it was a in very interesting, lively discussion. Um, I've learned a lot, and um, so oh, you're still there because the time was up. Actually, we can we can continue talking, but um, I think all of us we have to um, go to our next meetings. And um, I appreciate very much that you took your time, um, Barbara, Marie, and Guy. And uh, to the audience, thank you very much for your interest, uh, for your interest, for your interesting questions, and um, hope that we meet again sometime in the future. So, thank you very much again, and bye bye. Take care. All the best. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. And so, uh, I've got some Italian wine if you want some. So just <laughs> find a way to email me. I have an Italian winery. I'd love to sell you some wine if nothing else. Oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> You know, the argument for or against technology right now, I, I'd say based on my ability to get into this conference. <laughs> uh, it was difficult, wasn't it? I mean, uh, but we got in. <laughs> nice to meet you. And nice great. to see you. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye.